submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This is a reading from the first Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 8 and it says if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love I am nothing if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. This is the time in a, uh, in a Christian marriage service that uh, the minister normally gets up and gives a pep talk. But this is more than a pep talk because it actually comes from God's word, which we hold uh, special and precious. And, um, and I hope that as I give this message to Helen and James today, that I'm actually giving it to all of us. So those of you who are married today, uh, those of you who have a loved one with you today, maybe you can hold your hand and uh, think about the, hold each other's hands and think about how this message might apply to you today as well. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these readings which we've, uh, we've just heard and we pray that you'll give us a, a, a really clear sense of what they mean and how we might apply them to our lives because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our speech, it's easy to misunderstand what was said. Sherlock Holmes and his assistant Watson went on a camping trip and after a good camp fire meal, they laid down for the night and went to sleep. And some hours later, Holmes woke up and he nudged Watson. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, I see millions and millions of stars. Holmes asked, what does that tell you? Watson pondered for a moment. Astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Homologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is omnipotent, that is, he's mighty in power, and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I think we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. Why, Holmes? What does it tell you? Holmes was silent for a moment and then he spoke. Watson, someone has stolen our, our tent. <laughs> you see, it's easy to be misunderstood. 
Well, the Bible is often misunderstood, friends, and the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is no exception. In this passage, we read a word that was repeated quite a few times. This word is the word love. That love is this and that love is that. Many people today have preconceived ideas about what this word love means. In the Christian context, it means to love God and to love one's neighbour. And many people, when they think of love, their minds are directed to romantic stories or romantic soapies. Now, to add a further misunderstandings, I know for sure that this word love is, is misunderstood, especially in the context of the two passages that were read today. And so that we don't misunderstand, I want, you, want to make two points concerning this word love. The first point I want us to know is that love is a commitment. Love is a commitment. And what do I mean when I say that love is a commitment? Many of us think that love is how you feel about someone or something. James, when you look into Helen's face and into her eyes, I'm sure that you feel something. The heart beats a little faster, the knees shake, and you're having this marvellous, euphoric feeling as you gaze upon your beloved. In the original Greek language, the language of the New Testament, there are four words that, to describe for us the word love. But in English, we, we only have this one word and we tend to only use this one word, love. So its meaning crosses. It crosses over some differing situations. In the context of our reading, love is not an emotion. It's not a feeling, nor is it affections. God doesn't tell you to be sad, but if you are sad, this is a feeling. However, God tells all of us to love. When the Bible talks about love, it speaks of it as a, a commitment of one's will. Jesus speaks of love as something that you do, not something you feel. We're called to, to love God. We're called to love our neighbours. We're called to love our husband or our wife. And it's a given that we'll love our children. God calls us even to love our enemies. James, you're to love your wife, Helen. But love is misunderstood. Love is thought of as a feeling. In the Bible, love is an action. Love is an action that you deliberately decide to do. It's true that some people decide to stop loving and they decide to stop serving and they decide to stop caring. People don't fall out of love, rather they deliberately decide to stop loving. They deliberately decide to stop forgiving and to stop serving and to stop caring. However, love is a deliberate choice. You see, love is patient and kind because love does not envy, nor does it boast. It's not arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way, nor is it irritable or resentful, nor does it rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. So the first thing I want you to consider today is that love is a commitment. Feelings change, circumstances change, people even change. As time, goes older, we, uh, as time goes on, we all get older and some of us even get bigger. Our hair either falls out or it goes grey. Our bodies get tired. But love is a commitment of the will to bless the other person and to serve the other person to defer to the needs of the other person. James, in our reading in Ephesians today, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Now, the Apostle Paul is talking to all husbands here. How did Christ love the church? Well, Christ gave up his life for the church. He didn't say, love your wives when it's only convenient. 
nor to love your wife while she pleases you or only love your wife while she's young and she's beautiful. In other words, it doesn't say love your wife when it suits you. What we read here, it says love your wife as Christ loves love the church. So love is a deliberate, conscious decision of the will to commit to love. Love isn't a feeling. Rather, love is a commitment of the will. So love puts out the rubbish bin and it mows the lawn, if you have one, and it even picks up dirty clothes. It may even prepare dinners and clean the house and even iron clothes. That's a bit of a radical thing today. It even puts the toilet seat down. James, you have committed to loving this beautiful woman to serve Helen, to be patient and kind. And I already know James that he is patient and kind. But, but it tells us to do this every day. Similarly for you, Helen, love is a commitment. In Ephesians, it spells out, out something that's not readily accepted today. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Submit yourselves to your husbands. Helen, in your love for James, there will be moments that you may need to submit to his final decision. And that's God's plan. It's his, he's ordained that. That's a long discussion, but love is a commitment. Now, the second thing I want you to all to understand is that love is forever. Love is forever. Because love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends and it never fails. Guess what? There will be days when at least one of you, maybe both of you, you may be unlovely. There'll be days when there are dirty clothes on the floor, along with wet towels, or hair all over the bathroom Basin, there'll be days, James, when Helen's bad habits may become more noticeable. There'll be days, James, uh, when your bad habits will be very obvious. But love bears all things and believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things. Love never ends. It is because love is a commitment of the will to bear all things and to believe all things and to hope all things and to endure all things that love never ends and it never fails. No matter what the journey of life throws at you, no one falls out of love. Rather, some people just choose to stop loving. And love doesn't fail, but some people fail to love. Today, you've, you've remade this commitment. You've remade this promise to love one another before God and family. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Not until divorce, but for the rest of your lives. I'm sure that you'll both agree that this is the way that all of us want to be loved. The secret of this love, of course, is Jesus Christ. You see, we love because Christ first loved us. Once you understand how God loves, it makes all the difference. And John 3, 16, a most famous verse in the New Testament says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God loved us so much that he gave himself. He gave himself in the person of his son, Jesus, who sacrificially Bared all the pain and all the shame of our sin on the cross. But it didn't end on the cross because he rose from death to give all who believe in him an everlasting hope, our everlasting hope. We know this, we've heard this, we've just uh, had Easter last weekend. You may have heard the story of Easter. This one event changed the course of history. And I know that Helen and James, that you both love God. And you've come to faith in him through Jesus. So may I encourage you to always look to Jesus as your example, as your light, as your strength and as your hope. 
especially during those times. And always, of course, but especially during those times when things might be going the way you planned. Maybe when you're feeling a little bit unlovely. Therefore, love isn't a feeling, but rather a commitment of the will. Because love is a commitment, it never ends and it never fails. If you both love like this, your desires will always be for each other. They'll be for your, each other all your life. And there'll be lots, lots of loving affection because your love will be founded in Jesus. And his love lasts for eternity, friends. His love lasts for eternity. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you that indeed you do love us in a wonderful, wonderful way. And we pray that your love will permeate through the marriage of Helen and James and for, for all of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a, a wonderful song called In Christ Alone. We're going to pray now for a special prayer for James and Helen, so would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, our God of love, who established marriage for the welfare and happiness of mankind, yours was the plan and you said, it is not good for a man to live alone, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now our joys are doubled, since the happiness of one is the happiness of the other. Our burdens are halved, since when we share them, we divide the load. Will you bless James and Helen today, as they have recommitted themselves to each other in the covenant of marriage before you, dear Lord. 
May you bless them in all their future days as a married couple, as husband and wife. Would you bless James, sustaining him in all his endeavours of life. May James' strength be for Helen's protection. May you bless his character be a, to be a joy and assurance for Helen. May he live so that Helen may find in him the haven for which the heart of a woman truly longs. May he bless James in his personal Christian walk with you so that as he serves you, he will serve his wife. May you bless this loving woman, Helen. Would you, continue, would you continue to give her tenderness that makes her great, a deep sense of understanding and a great faith in you? Give her that inner beauty of soul that never fades, eternal youth that is found in holding fast to the things that never age. May Helen so live that James will be pleased always to revere and adore her. May both James and Helen, Helen never make the mistake of merely living for each other. Rather, it's two uniting and joining hands to serve you, the true and living God. Give them a great spiritual purpose in life. May they seek first the kingdom that is yours and its righteousness, so that all other things may be added to them. Loving you best, they shall love each other all the more. And being faithful to you, they will be faithful to each other. Help them not to expect that perfection of each other that belongs alone to you. May they minimise each other's weaknesses, be swift to praise and magnify each other's strength and beauty and see each other through a lover's kind and patient eye. May they continue to grow in your grace and knowledge and with little need to forgive each day. And dear Lord, may they bear each other's faults and weaknesses as you are with theirs. May they live according to your will as you bless and develop their character as they walk together in life. Give them enough tears to keep them tender, enough of failure to keep their hands clenched tightly in yours and enough success to make them sure they belong to you. May they never take each other's love for granted but always experience that breathless wonder that exclaims, out of all this world, you have chosen me. Then when life is done and the sun is setting, may they be found then as now, still hand in hand, thanking you so very much for each other. May they serve you happily, faithfully together until at least one shall lay the other in your arms. As they are already already united to you, we pray that you will bless their union in marriage as they become one flesh. This we ask through our blessed Saviour, Jesus Christ, the great lover of souls. Amen.